Um, it's my great honor to present Dr. Jill Weber, who several of you know, but, but not everyone. Um, Jill is a Near East archaeologist who finished at Penn in 2006. Right, 2006. Um, she is a zooarchaeologist, but her work very much touches upon uh, all kinds of things, but I feel like ritual has been a very much a through line for work in especially Syria, but she has also done excavations at Iraq and Kyrgyzstan more recently, Armenia, um, I do want to fill that. <laughs> the gaps. If there's more countries that I've missed. Um, today she's going to talk about research that I found extremely interesting um, about thinking of the role of odor and death in rituals in, in this case, northeastern Mesopotamia, Syria, and the fourth millennium BC. So precisely at the period of time where we're seeing the beginnings of urbanization, we're seeing the beginnings of writing, but there's a lot of change going on. Um, Shell Gas excavated a fairly amazing site that really reflects upon this. Right. So thank you, Lauren. Um, does anybody mind if I take this off to speak? No, no, no. Okay. Cool. Yeah. okay. Um, so uh, yes, welcome. So it's it's good to be back at Penn. It has been a while since I have since I have been here. Um, but I I am very interested in ritual, and in part that's just because when I am I, I am a archaeologist. I'm an archaeologist, but I'm often these days in the lab. But I'm called out whenever there's bones or whenever there's something unusual, and usually the two go together. And so people will call me out. So I, I tend to uncover and excavate some really, really interesting things, which leads me to think about them, I think, in some, in some different ways. Um, so here we are. Let me start this. And we're talking about scent and odor, literally odor, skeletons and odor. And I think... Um, in, in different parts of the world and for different people, one gets more or less familiar with scent because everything around you has an odor, but if you're living in a place perhaps on a farm, perhaps one is a farmer, uh, perhaps you live near a slaughterhouse, perhaps you live near a dying factory, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, there are different animal pollutants in the air that, that give you more or less of a sense of, of smell. And, and of course, smell is one of the more evocative senses, so when one does encounter smells, these, these bring you back to a time, a place, a person, an event, hello, and, uh, and again, evocative. They, they, they bring to mind things that you may have done, seen, or, or, or well, smelled. And like I said, various people have different levels of familiarity and comfort with smell. So, uh, for instance, you can see on the upper um, on the upper left, people just just kind of you know sitting down for, for tea for a, for a hookup with with their sheep, no problem there. Or you see in the um, the middle right, uh, individuals who are working with animal parts who are clearly in the midst of, of the scent of, of death and decay. Or you've got the Chicago stockyards on the lower left, and anybody who had been living near those would have been daily confronted with the pungent odor of both living and dead and decaying animals, and again, very evocative of, of an action or a thing, but, um, but scent, scent is in the air, scent is something people deal with on a relatively frequent basis. And I, I bring that all up to say, we're, we're going to be talking about something that is as experiential as scent, but I want you to start thinking about just the odors you encounter on, on a daily basis and what those kind of mean to you, what they bring up. So, we're traveling over to Syria, a place that I have not had the opportunity to be to since 2010. Um, anyway, here we are up in the upper right, so that would be the northwest corner of Syria, and we're going to two sites, Tel Brak and Tel Mejunia. So Tel Brak, one of the more large sites in the ancient, well, in the modern world, but up from the ancient world, so this is a 50 to 70 hectare site of up to 40 meters in height. And literally you drive up and you think it's a mountain. That's, that's a site. That's all man-made. Nothing mountain about it. Um, so as Lauren discussed, we're, we're to a point in time when um, 
urbanization is arriving, is emerging. So at Telbrock, I've got two uh, uh, images here. One is from the LC2, so at roughly 4000 BC. One is from the LC3 on the, uh, the other side, the left. Wait, that's your, your right. right? From from the LC3. So you can see that at this point in time, at about 4000 BC, this is already a fairly large area. The entirety of the 50 to 70 hectare mountains occupied. Some of the smaller sites, the South Corona of sites about you know, a couple kilometers to the outside are occupied. Um, already at that time, a pretty large settlement. But then suddenly, uh, a couple hundred years later, we had a huge influx of infilled settlement where nearly the entirety of that corona is occupied, including seven so-called satellite settlements around, around the main one. Um, at this time, we have evidence for increased population, human population. We have evidence for increased specialization of different industry, including um, you know, textile work going perhaps from domestic locales into industrial, uh, uh, communal locales and public buildings. We have lots more evidence for bureaucracy, so increases in um, ceilings, increases in tokens and little, you know, uh, administrative tokens. So in any kind of administrative genre you can think of, we had increased numbers of them, more centralized findings of them, and much more public architecture to contain them. Uh, there's also evidence that shows at this time um, that sheep and, and goat um, herding actually did become less sort of backyard ranching and moved out into the steppe. Um, if anybody wants to ask you about that later, feel free, but I'll, I'll leave the details of that out for now. Uh, large numbers of sheep and goat, large numbers of cattle that it's unclear at the moment if we're going from with the cattle from, from backyard herding to ranching or if they're still staying in, in the backyard. But sheep and goats sprawled. So we're really talking about a, a space that's super, super heavily occupied. And we're moving away from just um, settlement with surrounded by fields and an idyllic setting. Um, also something I find very interesting, amongst the ceilings that are found at that time are these early images of lions, as well as what we think is some sort of kingly figure, priestly figure, priest-king figure. Uh, but, but one interesting thing about lions in this, in my understanding of this, is that it is when you start impinging upon their landscape that they're drawn more further into your own world. So at this time when we start to see kind of this, this greater uh, iconography and imagery of, of lions and maybe even lion uh, attacks or protection, uh, we also have a time when we're, we're expanding into the landscape. So we're going to be talking about Tel Brock, but this is Tel Majnun. This is one of the larger of the little satellite sites that we discussed. What's interesting about this site, like the other little satellites, it was founded at uh, in the LC3, so when when the entirety of those of that corona was occupied, and it is almost 100% rubbish. So it's not an occupied. It's not occupied by the living. It's not occupied with houses. It is occupied by trash. And here's simply another view of, of that site. Um, just a little topographic, you know, for your, the amount of the area that was actually excavated. Uh, of course, the little red squares. The site itself is um, up to seven meters deep in places, and again, all rubbish. And it's something like, uh, honestly, I forgot, two hectares, three hectares, it's, it's small. So, like I said, it is entirely filled with rubbish. However, some of that rubbish includes human bones. And these are human bones in what are essentially mass graves, but in varying degrees of intactness and um, in varying context. So here we have, and I'm doing this by, um, by chronology. So the earliest mass grave we have evidence of is in area MTW. And what you can see here, clearly you see some human bones, you see the skull staring out of you. But we also have uh, animals, so we have humans and animals, and the human bones are in various stages of, um, of articulation and disarticulation. So as you can see, you see the skull, 
but it's, and, and it's important that its mandible is still connected. So that's not at a, at a complete skeletonization stage where it's completely falling apart. Um, we have full uh, torsos in some cases. Uh, here's just a long bone not connected, the femur not connected to anything else, another one. And then you can see a sheep skull, you can see some, um, there's a, 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 some cow vertebrae here. So very much mixed in with animal parts. Um, you can see from this from this chart, and, and by the way, this, let me just sorry, go back. So this is actually a, a death pit, let's call it, a mass grave that was roughly 20 meters long, that we know of, that, that, that it might be longer, that's the extent that was excavated, by about three to four meters wide. And we expect there are several hundred human bodies, again, that we know of, and then um, on top of these were placed these animal bones. So as of now, or as of, as of what was excavated, we had minimally 100 sheep and goat and 20 to 30 cat cows, cattle. Uh, but again, multiply that by about four because we didn't, we didn't fully excavate that, that area. Um, again, you can see roughly 70, 75% sheep goat, 20% boasts. The rest were uh, pig, equid, and gazelle, which are common in the settlement at this time, but very distinctly not common at Tel Meshuna on this pile of human bones. Uh, the cattle themselves, the, all the bones were, were uh, butchered in certain ways, so we have all of the humeri were smashed either, pro we suspect, prior to um, prior to cooking to release some juices, which is something we found in other parts of, of the tell at other periods of time. Uh, also, you can see it here, some of them have been, have been um, snapped after the fact and from air. Okay. Uh, these are some of the smashed sheep and goat skulls. So everything was, was butchered in, in almost the, in exactly the same way. Uh, mostly for disarticulation, very little of it was for meat filleting. So we think that, the, and, and many of the bones were burnt, which you can see here. Um, large proportion of burnt bones. And, but again, whole animals were deposited. Uh, sometimes the, the uh, joints were left in articulation, mostly not, um, but many of them were burnt and uh, they were literally just deposited on top of the, um, the animal bones, or the human bones. Um, and I can, we're gonna talk in a little bit about what this is, but it matches what we found to be the feasting signature found at Tel Brock and Tel Mishnuna, uh, which in essence is um, large numbers of whole animals, large numbers larger than what one could eat fresh by any given individual or even small group of people, um, uh, cooked, deposited uh, all at one time, and then quickly covered over in the place in which they were utilized. Okay. So now we're going to move on to area EM. This is slightly later in time, and what you can see here, um, I, I recognize that some of you don't know what the human bones or the animal bones look like, but within this we have some large human bones, so again we have some femora, um, and then you have, and, and frankly I can't see from here, but, what, but here we have clearly some cattle bones. But so once again you have human bones and you have animal bones, intertwined, but now they're much more disarticulated and they're starting to become a lot more fragmented uh, and they're becoming more and more removed from their, um, from any kind of primary burial. So, sorry, the first slide I showed you, those were clearly secondary burials of humans, okay? So, um, forgive me. Let me go back to that for one moment because that's an important thing. So here, again, this is, this is chronological, but um, these, are, these are clearly not skeletons in primary position. These are skeletons, human skeletons, that have been removed from a burial that they had previously been in. Uh, they are mostly complete skeletons, but there are pieces missing, predominantly of the hands and feet, so small little items that might get lost when you move something from one place to another. Largely speaking, these are secondary burials. Okay, that was important, sorry about that. Because now we come to area EM, and these human bones are still are a subset now of the bones that have been in the secondary burials. So I think of this as almost a tertiary burial. So once again, we have uh, fewer and fewer of the whole skeleton. We have fewer of the smaller bones. We also have almost no uh, pelvic bones. 
and there are still skulls. So you can see here, for instance, this is a, a so-called cluster. And what it looks like, I think, from where you're sitting is what it looked like as excavated. It looks like a, a basket or a bag, something that was maybe gathered up and, and then dumped. And um, again, we, we're think, we think of this as sort of a tertiary deposit. Um, not only were these uh, more fragmented, more, um, fewer bones involved, but they were also more heavily manipulated. So here's uh, Dr. Augusta McMahon, who was at the time the, um, the director of, of Tel Brock and Tel Majuna, and she has in front of her several human, so on, on the bottom here we have human bone, several bones that have been uh, manipulated, made into what I, what I would refer to as expedient tools. And these are, they're, they're very similar to the animal bones found also in that deposit and others that were also made into tools, utilized and deposited on site. So, so created where they were, used where they were and deposited where they were. So on the top you see three different bones that had been utilized as uh, implements of some sort. And then on the bottom you see a human bone that was used as an implement of some sort. Um, again, here's Augusta with several of them in front of her. There were roughly 42. So we're not talking about a few, we're talking about 42. And most of them were made with uh, human femora, but also with uh, tibia. And in the same way, you can see the animal bones also usually are made in, in, in these sites anyway that I've seen with tibia, with metapodia. Uh, and, and in part because they're stronger. Now with the with animals, they almost always leave a distal or proximal end as a handle. I've never seen that amongst the human bones. I suspect it's because a lot of times the, the human um, uh, articular ends are, are spongier and they, they, just, they just aren't as solid and they're big. So if you're talking about trying to hold the end of somebody's femur, it's, it's pretty huge, frankly. So I, I suspect that's why they wouldn't keep them, but who knows. Um, and then finally, we have an area where the human skeletons were all laid out. So they're laid out in burial, very kind of lightly buried. And obviously they've been excavated here, but you can see from the surface around them that they really did not have much over them. They were, for the most part, exposed. So they were, they were roughly exposed. Um, many of them have light evidence of gnawing. Very few of them uh, have, were, were, were pulled apart, so clearly somebody was um, watching over them, protecting them, at least shooing away the larger predators and dogs. Um, but uh, the, what we see here are, are skeletons in various stages of um, exposure. And what happens when, when that occurs is they're they kind of different of their bones and between different of the skeletons, they have varying levels of weathering. And they also have, as I said, light marks of scavenging. And, 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 but again, not, not uh, these aren't ripped apart. Their, their articular ends aren't chewed off. These are, these are lightly disturbed. How, you know, I'm, I'm sure insect activity, probably some bird damage. But, um, but notably, all of the other bones in every single state of disarticulation have the exact same type of, of uh, weathering and the same type of scavenging, lack of scavenging. So it seems as though all of the bones at one time or other were treated the same way. And then um, finally, this is just one other area of the site where you can see some of the larger parts. You can, you can kind of see how in moving bones around, different things got taken at different times. And so um, skulls, which are, which are clearly, people recognize human skulls, these are picked up. Um, the jaw bones, it, it's actually, frankly, I, I'm, I'm still sometimes wondering if um, some of these things got confused for human bones, or because you see some filtering, like, like at certain points people were trying to simply collect human bones, but some animal bones get in the way. And at other times they're just collecting everything. So it's, un it's unclear to me, neither here nor there, really. Um, and then what, what's missing from all of those areas um, are infants. And this is common for anybody who works in the Middle East, probably from other parts of the world, that infants, especially the youngest of infants, are treated differently. They're not buried with 
adults. They're often buried in courtyards. In fact, this is still the case, was still the case in modern Damascus, where babies would be buried in, in a courtyard of a home as opposed to, because they'd be afraid, is, is what I've been told, instead of being buried in actual cemeteries, extramurally in um, scary locations. So no, uh, no infants in this area. Um, okay, so I just want to go over what I believe we have here. So we have um, stage one primary burial, okay? And then stage two after, and I'm gonna say after one, one two, three months because of the, the way that the, uh, because of the slight exposure and because of, of where we see different bones being still attached and those not being attached, they were moved, they were gathered and removed and, and reburied after one to three months when they very likely did not smell anymore, but which they were not completely skeletonized, they were defleshed, they still had some tendons on them, and some parts were still together. Uh, stage three, then we have tertiary burial, where those were actually collected and, and removed. And then we have stage four, where these bones are all getting more heavily fragmented. And I'm getting ahead of myself with the forgetting, but um, these are then fragmented and forgotten. And in fact, that, that is my theory about this, and this is where we're gonna then get into the, the use of scent and smell, is that I think, um, you know, here we are at this site where space was suddenly at a, at a complete premium because more population, uh, large, you know, more things going on, um, needing space for rubbish, and now, you know, how do we deal with all of these people, all of the space, all of these needs? And so I interpret this as a, as a time when there's such a strong need for greater resources or there's such a fight for resources that in fact, instead of creating ancestors like many people do, they need to forget their ancestors. And so they were, they were creating a right in which they could forget their ancestors and all of the attendant holds on land and space and resources that those people have. So we're leaving uh, measurement, we're going back to the main tell for a minute. And we're in this part of the tell, this area TW, which uh, is on one of the main entry points into the, into the city. And uh, Mejuna is over here. We come along here, and we're just right there. Um, and in the LC3, this area had a massive, massive public building fitted out with large ovens, like you see uh, on the upper right. And in essence, it was um, it had a, a reception hall for what we interpret again as feasting. So not only did we have the niched uh, facade and some internal features that made it pretty uh, pretty glitzy, but it also was fitted out with skins of bear, skins of lion, uh, skins of fox, and I don't know what other you know plastic imagery may have been in there, but those are the things that we have found. So from that space uh, and from the feasting, from the remains found within it, we were able to find a feasting signature for the entire site. So by and large, uh, what, what came from this room, these rooms and from these features were a heavy focus on sheep, goat, and cattle, which is um, both similar to and different from the rest of the site. Much more heavy focus here, much more specialized. Uniform processing. So again, all the butchery is roughly the same and is mass and occurs with uh, whole animals being brought in, whole animals being utilized, uh, and whole animals being deposited in C2. Uh, and then we have direct heat cooking in large-scale grow oven. And there you have an example, but we have multiple examples. We have, uh, we have this dome. This dome was replaced by grills. The grill was reused several times. So we have multiple uh, instances of feasting in these same areas with the, the leaving of the um, rubbish in place. And I, I just want to briefly go through this because I really enjoyed it. We were excavating um, uh, the, final, the final layer of feasting, and it was, as I said, all laid out, left in, in situ across, across the courtyard. And you know, people often talk about diacritical feasting and, and ways to tell like how how certain people are uh, more elite or get certain things or how you differentiate a feast. And what was really interesting was how across the courtyard, from east to center to west, the bones were just completely um, laid out in a in a very. Pres uh, 
uh, I can't think of the word, very precise manner. So up here where we had the fewest bones and where probably one would think that you have the most um, special people eating, we have a very select group. We have only right side elements of gazelle and sheep. Um, in the west, where we have you know, the second, second highest number of, um, of uh, bones, we have another select but kind of different features. We have uh, some, again, right side elements, but now running goat. And then for the first time, we have some, some uh, left symmetry elements of sheep. And then also some cattle and um, uh, hair, but they were differentiated in the least. And then in the main area, you have only left symmetry or undifferentiated element. And when I say undifferentiated, that, that likely means skull, ribs, uh, vertebrae. Uh, but here we have limb bones and um, mostly limb bones. But here we have only left symmetry elements of gazelle, sheep, and goat, and then again the central. So I think you can kind of you can kind of come up with a with a preference for the meat, which I find very interesting. So the preference you can put gazelle and sheep up at the top of that of that preferential taxa, uh, taxon, taxa, and obviously right side elements. And from there, you know, you, you, the left symmetry elements um, are less preferable, and goat being kind of the, the third tier animal, which again I find that very interesting. But importantly. These things were left in situ on the floor. They were, they were butchered in the courtyard, they were consumed, and they were deposited there. Um, I call it, yes, trajectory of deviant disposal. So they were left and deposited there, and then, and then covered up, and, and the floors rebuilt, and then things go up there. That's why I'm calling this deviant disposal. So we have the, this grill, or this uh, feature, we have a feast, and then we have all of this material rotting left on the, on, the, on the ground. And uh, this is rotting, this is left, this gets covered over uh, with a clean layer of sand, and then they do it again. And they have a feast, and they do their butchery, and then they leave everything there, and then they cover it over, and they do the same thing again. And this is the only part of this building where this happens, by the way. Everything else is clean. They take away everything, they, they, they clean the space, they don't leave rotting smelling animal bones uh, in, in a, especially in a monumental area that was likely a reception hall, probably for dignitaries, various people visiting the city. But it probably smelled. It probably smelled like, like decay. Um, so seeing this and then, and then seeing the, um, the feasting and the way that the human bones were treated, um, I came up with the idea that in both cases, the human, the sorry, the um, decaying, rotting meat was used in a way to signify not biological death, but social death. And so, so we don't exactly know why there needed to be this this ritual in the monumental building. I think we can we can understand why. We'll talk about that in a minute about the the. the Bodies. But um, we don't exactly know why this building needed uh, a, a termination deposit or a ritual closure of each floor before they got rebuilt. But I believe that the evidence, given how different it is, how deviant it is from treatment of floors in that building and every other building at the time, I think we can understand it as deviant. Uh, and I think, given given what we know now about how also the bodies were treated, the human bodies. There's some sort of some sort of ritual that, that has a sanctification or desanctification specialness attached to it. it it's, it's a ritual that kind of must be talking about si signifying the place in society something going on there. And again, don't know what it is, but it has it has um, uh, it's akin to something like a mosque renewal ceremony. A church consecration ceremony, or right? oftentimes in in the ancient world, I mean, people would destroy something in order to rebuild. So that destruction marked marked the ability. Maybe that marked a uh, closure with with the gods in one sense, and then starting another deposit uh, marked the reopening of that communication. 
So again, I, I don't even think it matters exactly what the reason for it was, but I think it's very clearly a part of a part of a closing of communication and a reopening of a communication, and most importantly, a, a signifier. It signified something. Um, and then you know you see that you have if you're going to uh, change a church into a brewery, usually a priest will come out and desanctify the space, sacralize the space so that it's it's once again it's not it's not got the same signification of a church. It's now a brewery, and I think there is actually one that's in Pittsburgh, so I pulled that from. Um, okay, so then back to the bodies. Now we're talking about lack of space, and we're talking about what might need to be done with bodies when you have a lack of space. Well, if you have a lack of space, we've got some, some um, comparenda. So look at the catacombs in Paris. Um, bones were removed from the ground, they were stacked, they were ordered. Uh, there were all sorts of things. You have catacombs in Naples, you have catacombs in Paris. You have the Kutnohora um, church in, in the Czech Republic, where the same thing, and, and even the, the bones, they needed the space, the bones were made into urns. The both human bones were made into chandeliers. If you've never been, it's a spectacular place. It's a wonderful place to visit. But again, they took those bones and they commemorate, commemorated them. They, they memorialized them, they, 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 they didn't debase them. I mean, we might think, some people might think that in fact they did. I mean, they were mutilated these bodies. But nonetheless, they save them and they and they use them. They still have they're still human bodies and they're still treated as such and they're still actually in a sanctified space. But that's not and I'm, I'm going to go back. That's not the case with these bones here, right? So we come from this uh, this first stage of primary burial where they're where they're lightly exposed. Okay, and at this time they're still human. We come over here, and it's pretty clear based on when they were uh, moved, because you can kind of recreate that from the stages at which different bones become skeletonized and become disarticulated from the body. It's pretty clear that this movement of these bones took place after the period when these bones smelled the most. So they were left in place during the period of, of advanced and major decay and bloating. And then after a period of, again, a couple weeks to, to a couple months, they were no longer as, of course they still smelled a little bit, but they were no longer as smelly. And that's when they were initially moved. And so I think one kind of, kind of comes to the suggestion that once that smelling stopped, that's when their death, their biological death was done. So then they were moved to the feasting area. A large feast was had over them, upon which all of the decaying animal bones were, were left. All these bones, um, and, and when I say all these bones, and we're talking, um, I think I calculated that it would have been tens of thousands of kilo, kilograms of meat. Um, and obviously they ate some of the meat and things, but, but all that, that, those bones, all that left over would be probably about a thousand animals left on top in various states of decay. It was covered over, but lightly, and I think, you know, if you've been around areas where there are lots of dead animals, it stinks. So again, a long time after uh, they're laying, laying these down and leaving this, this odiferous area. Following that, following a long time, and again, you can see once these, these bones were picked up again, there's, they're even further disarticulated. The human bones are further disarticulated, the animal bones are further disarticulated, so we know that a period of time has passed. And it's likely, and I'd speculate, that it was after the animal bones had stopped smelling. But at that time, when both had stopped smelling, they're moving them and they're, and they're, they're now treating them as trash. They've now, they're, they're actually utilizing the bones, they've, they've snapped some of them, they've made them into tools, we're not sure what they're doing, perhaps it was something commemorative, but we don't know that, and I don't think the rest of it suggests that. Uh, they're actually broken into little fragments that you can't really see here, the skulls are, are left, none of this stuff is collected and commemorated and, and memorialized. But instead, it's, it's moved away, it's, it's, now, it's now simply part of the rubbish. Nothing about it is, is human anymore. And, so it's, it's my idea that we go back to this need. We have all this space that's getting eaten up 
by rubbish. We have all this space that's getting eaten up by greater needs of the population to be fed. We have greater needs for the, the needs of the population for public, uh, public buildings, for uh, events to take place to help you know, the, the politics, the, the social life of the place. But they're being, they're being, um, they're being eaten by this, the lack of space. And so instead of memorializing these people, and instead of granting them um, you know, lifelong ancestral uh, veneration, ancestral hold on resources, they are going through the social death of these people to, to break their hold on the resources in the land that are needed by people in this, in this emerging urbanized landscape. And let's remember, this is one of the first urbanized areas in the world. So this is, this is new. We don't know how people acted. Um, None of this is normalized. None of this is something you can look at elsewhere. And so to look at these burials and to look at the, the feasting on top and to think about it, none of this is, is comparable to anywhere else. And so we can't, we have no idea whether this is actually normal or if this is aberrant. But I think given all of the areas we find this on the site, how much it matches the feasting area um, and kind of the aberrant behavior there, but, but reuse, aberrant reuse. I, I think we can start to understand that there is something about this feasting, and whether it's the smell or not, but I think what makes it more about the smell is, that, is the point about moving the people, and, and that the people get moved when, really, when they stop smelling, when they become less like people. At each stage, it's about being less alive, and these people are less alive when the smell is gone. And then recreating that death, that social death, by, by again bringing on a smell, and then once that smell is ended, then they're fully discarded. So it's those two things that make me comfortable suggesting something like this. Because I realize that when, when you say, you know, they're using scent in this way, that's, that's it's a little challenging. It's, it's challenging to, to have evidence for that. But I, I think I think I I believe I see that here. I believe there is evidence for that. I'm sure it can be it can be talked about in other ways. Is this the most parsimonious? I actually think it is. But uh, that's you know that's up to that's up to everybody. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I do believe that in this case, scent is used as a uh, as a secondary cultural death, after which time people can forget about their ancestors and not venerate them, and then use the the resources that in which they held that they needed for for their own lives to come. There you go. Thank you. Death and burial, I think of Domus Tepe, 
which is also a mass burial pit of humans that become more and more and more fragmented, and in which there are some animal bones, and which there's even possibly some uh, evidence for cannibalism. Uh, but again, that, 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 that last bit is very, who knows, if there's slight, slight evidence for that. Um, and then if we're talking about elsewhere, I don't know, Lauren, can you think of anything? Um, Tepe Gabra for the LC2 stuff. Okay. I mean, there are individual burials there with mm -hmm. stuff in them. Yeah, that's yeah. true, that's true. But I'm thinking if we go forward, I mean, there's like Banach, Tel Banach, and, yes. and something that maybe is similar with this well, idea of, I mean, no, very I don't know, true. maybe very not, true. maybe not. We're, no, that's very true. So when, when you move forward, but now you're moving forward at least 1,500 years, yeah. and then you start to get, you know, there are evidence like of, of uh, bodies moved from tombs mm -hmm. into monuments, but there's nothing like this. So, so at this point in time, there's very, very, very little. And there's certainly nothing in Tel Brock that suggests that this is deviant versus normal. This is a very weird time because or well, you know people must have died. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, one of the main problems in Southern Mesopotamian archaeology has always been where are the dead yeah. during this moment of, you know, this first urban explosion. Mm -hmm. So you have Oryx, you have, you know, this 400 hectare city, so this, you know, four kilometer squared city with tens of thousands of people in it, and there's not any bodies that have been retrieved. So it's always been like, what are they doing? You know, like, why do we not have any remains? So the only thing I can compare it to is Domus Tepe, yeah, with a, with a death pit with animals. You had a question? I did. It's similar to the <coughs> point that you're now making, but my, my question is basically, was, is this normal or you know, where, where are other people buried? Are, are these local people, have you know, any work been done to identify the isotopic work and so on to to know these are actually people who are local versus those who are captives or acquired through warfare or other circumstances. Is this a response to some kind of disease? So, so I mean, things of this kind from necessitate some right. extraordinary measures to deal with the death that arises from, from epidemic forms of disease. Right, and okay, and there are different schools of thought on this. So um, Augusta McMahon, um, and, and I co-wrote an article with her about this, but I, she and I disagree on it. She believes this was the result of warfare. Um, the, the, the ages of the bodies do not represent a catastrophic kill-off. So these do not represent a, an entire population being killed in a, in a pandemic. These do not represent an entire population being killed in a single massacre, um, according to me. Augusta might argue differently that they do, but I think buried in this area, we have no babies, as I said, and we have no senescent individuals. So the, the, old, the eldest members of society are not buried here. This is all, this is men and women from five to 40. That's the main, the main um, uh, their injuries are few, None of them had injuries that created death, but uh, roughly 10 of them had injuries that healed in life, uh, uh, knocks to the head. Um, so again, the notion of how they died is still, is still unclear. And so I, I do not feel comfortable claiming this is, this is a, a fight, this is warfare. Um, Augusta, again, the director of the light, would, makes the claim that these are, uh, these are people who were killed in battle. Um, some of them maybe even uh, the other side, you know, warriors from the other side, and thus, that's why they're treated the way they are. Um, I don't think there's any evidence for that, and I especially don't think there's any evidence for that because we don't see any other dead people. I, where are the, again, where, where are the dead people? These are the only dead people we have. I don't know why we would treat them as thus something special. To me, this is not so, the, the only dead people we have, and this is the norm. So, go ahead. So then, are these persons then, you know, you have evidence of all the sacrifice of the animals, that in itself is, the volume is quite impressive. Are these humans being sacrificed as well? So, and I, I don't think so, but again, and we certainly don't see any way in which they were killed. 
and then it was looked for. And, and you had the box that were laid out so you'd be able to see these things. The, the animals, I wouldn't call them sacrificed because they were, they were a meal. They were, I believe, they were a feast. And the number of them is so large that either they're killing off huge num numbers of their herd, including the cattle. The cattle were largely juvenile, which is not something one does with animals like cattle, who the expenditure you put into them is, is a lot. And you want those young to grow and, and, and give you, you know, your money's worth. But, um, so it seems to me that, and I, I think I stopped short, the best way to explain what might be happening here in these huge numbers of both animals, oops, both animals and people is something like what you see among Native American tribes, and here I have Huron, but you also see it um, uh, among other tribes where they would, after an amount of time, in this case I think this was 12 years, bring their dead together. They would they would take them from the primary burial. They would come to a special location. They would have three days of feasting. They would rebury them, or I think in this case they actually would then take them elsewhere. But in other cases they would rebury them on spot. Um, and this, this is how they treated their dead. In their case, it was a commemoration. But again, it was a, it was a, there's a parallel there, at least in uh, coming together, they would bring food, they would have this feast. And I think when you talk about hundreds and thousands of animals, you have to, to talk about maybe a lot of people bringing their dead from various parts of the, of the countryside and also bring animals because it's really tough to, to kill off a thousand animals and not affect your life. So, you know, I think we're dealing with not necessarily a single site's dead and thus having to think about it as warfare, but we're thinking about it as a, as a region, and especially if we're talking about an urbanized area, a region's dead who come together, maybe, maybe come together from different areas. Maybe they even come together and, and share some, some of their resources. Maybe some of the sheep were off with somebody else, and so they bring them back. I mean, we're talking about, you know, her, uh, a contract hurting or some sort of thing, whatever. That, I'm just, spitballing that, but, but I think they're coming together in, in, a, in a social right. So uh, there's a follow-up question then. So if the, main, the main tell is very large. Yeah. And the smaller tells are, are flanking it, some number of them. Do you believe they all represent the same kind of deposits? Are they all in just sort of in sequence or then or sort of Ritual practice, sacrifice, and so on. So they're not occupation sites. They represent long-term occupation of the place and the same use of this, these smaller deposits, or depositions, um, are just they just accumulate through time. So you can actually sort of see how the sequence of occupation follows from, from mapping out all the remains of these different tells. So they all exist at the same time. None of, none of the other ones have explored, but they were not explored prior to the, to the war. Okay. Um, they're all full of trash. But they're also full, at least one of them has a big, a big pottery kiln, a big ceramic area, a um, domestic house, a burial, a single burial, we think of what we call the pottery. Um, so, you know, they're not all the same, but they're not all, it, it is very clear that these aren't, we can't, we're not thinking of this urban area as all of these outer satellite tells as being, as being full of um, high density housing. There is, there is, I mean, they are looking for their trash deposits because they, you know, they've got a lot of crops, they've got a lot of animals, there's specialized um, uh, crop agriculture here. So they need their land. I mean, it's clear they're, they're, they're building up, the buildup of space is not the buildup that we think of built up space. It's, it's built up trash. I did want to, one, I'm sorry, one thing, I did want to go back to that um, because like, this, like I said, ceramics, like that kiln is out on the edge. So if you're talking about smells, I'm, I'm still trying to think of where, you know, where, as you say, the sweet smell of dog, you know, where you can find that. But of course, it is spread out in the fields. And the fields are, you know, between the satellite and the settlement. So that area between those is, 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 all, um, is all agriculture. But I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> I was curious about, so you kind of took us through these stages of death. And I like the splitting up of biological death from social death, and I, I'm a Native American archaeologist, and there are a lot of these instances in most cultures of sort of what you do with the dead and what happens to that person's soul or essence or whatever is separate from the body, all of these moments. And then I was curious, sort of following it through in my head of what how Native communities 
would, would pursue this. Then at the end, you sort of talk about fragmentation and forgetting, and this idea that, that they become trash, they become refuse at a certain point. And I'm curious if the, if that, how sure of that process you are. So like, does that refuse that they become, the human bones and animal bones get broken up, does it actually look like refuse from otherwise everyday life? Is there pottery and plant remains and, stone mixed in or are they sort of still a separate special category of trash that you know consists now of, of humans and also non-human creatures that were, were buried there's other there's rubbish 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 on top of it. it's just all mixed yeah, in yeah and so i mean then, you know there are there are discrete discrete deposits of the humans and the animals just like there are discrete deposits of many ceilings with ceramics so, so there are discrete deposits of just other junk and ceramics and occasional animal bones and uh, but it is it is it is rubbish. Interesting. Yeah. And it's not it's not marked off in any way. It's mm -hmm. not separated. Mm -hmm. No, I can see. Uh... Okay. No, I was just going to uh, remark on. Uh, I think your uh, idea of scent marking the biological phase of decomposition and death. You know, and I was thinking of South America, which I area that I did research in. And, uh, I'm trying to recall uh, in the London Colorado, they have a pattern of the uh, taking the body after it's dead, uh, and at least in the ethnographic record documented by the Catholic missionaries there, leaving the body in a pit right there in the village, on uh, the edge of the village. And then once the decay has taken place, you know, then taking out the bones, painting them, and, and performing a secondary burial. But I've never occurred to me to think about the smell of it, you know, which is probably a really important marker when you're living in these circular villages and you kind of can't help but, you know, observe that. You know, yeah. The, 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 the punch and smell of the body decay. So I just think that's a really, you know, I, I don't want to let that hypothesis go by. That's really good. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah, thank you. And, and it, is, it is true, right? I think anybody who's, who lives out just in the country here, you know, stays somewhere. Um, you, you know where people, and again, came back to that, at Tel Brock, I mean, there's a space where people, you know, the dead dogs would, would get thrown out just a little bit in the field, but you still, of course, smell them, but they're not left near you, right? You get rid of all that stuff. But yeah, they, they knew the scent. They knew the scent. They knew exactly what it was. They lived with it daily, whether it's through dying animals around them, or the death of humans, or, or what, but it's the scent they knew, and that they had the power to deal with, and they did. Or they did, they, they deliberately didn't deal with it. Well, it has a power, so it's gradual fading over time. Yeah. You know, it is significant. You know, that phase really shows a tapering curve over time. So, you know, that is really an interesting observation. I think the, your, the most interesting thing that you said that I wasn't anticipating. <laughs> um, well, I've heard that part of the paper before. Yeah. <laughs> Your argument is more subtle than when I think about how you said people had to have been watching these dead bodies decompose and keeping the dogs and the birds off. Because I've done some stuff recently on uh, observing of sky burials where you just you put the people out and you encourage the birds to come chunk away at it. And I would also want to mention to you like something from another place where this kind of happens in some of the open plazas of Tiwanaku in Bolivia. And there are, it's a taphonomic argument based on the, the condition of the humans later about how they would have been lightly weathered on one side as they were staked out. But I had not thought about having to monitor and control that, how the kind of the worship and acknowledgement of that situation would have involved monitors, which is a very important aspect of the experience of smell as well. Yeah. And that was work that Deb Bloom did, and I said, oh, we should read you the whole sample and really do the tap on of every body. And she said, no. So it's out there, but it might not have been recorded to me all, but it's very similar to what you're okay. yeah, doing. Okay, I'd like to see that. It, but, but, because it's true, right? Because, you know, we talk about, like, even if you're looking at, and, you know, right now, this is just slightly later, depending on the phase of chocolate cake, where, where you, you have vultures, you, you have imagery of vultures, um, you know, attacking these bodies. They're, they're literally being, yeah, you had imagery from later in time where the enemy's bodies were being attacked by the But, um, but you, you all know what birds can do to a corpse. I mean, it can, it can pull 
pull it apart. You don't get left a body. And so to have light scavenging mark, and there are some bones that, that have what could clearly be, they're large enough to be lion or, um, you know, or even, or even some, some pecs on the head from vultures, but um, if there wasn't somebody shooing those animals away, those, those bodies would be gone. And so clearly there was, there was that. Um, thank you for your talk. I wonder uh, if we were to kick it up a level of sort of theoretical or meta-methodological meta abstraction for the non-archaeologists in the room. I wonder if you could say a little bit about how scent or sense is being figured or figures within archaeology, archaeological science today, because it's figured as a kind of leaf motif for you, you, the through line throughout this entire talk today, but I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you see it figuring in the work of your colleagues in archaeology or the archaeological sciences. I mean, I don't. You don't? I don't. <laughs> and I think, you know, I hear about, like, I, I, and of course I don't know at all. Okay. And if I'm thinking about other um, areas of the world that I don't know much enough about, if I'm thinking about, just thinking about Syria, you know, now Iraq, Turkey, um, I don't hear much about scent. Mm -hmm. And again, even if you're thinking about experiential archaeology, I think people have more um, on sight lines. Like I think because sight lines are something you can still recreate, right? But, but thinking about scent and odor, um, certainly not bodies. And, and, and I think the only time I hear it mentioned is when you're talking about, oh, surely that wasn't a blank put there because it would stink. Right? And I, that's, I feel like so there's a tiny bit of work in Roman context, but it's usually more, um, I mean, it, it tends to be drawing from texts more. And the thing is, like, the scents don't tend to be mentioned so much in any of the texts. Like, so Juvenal, Juvenal has his famous satire is about living in Rome. Yeah. And what's interesting is that when he's complaining about life in Rome, he's not actually complaining about, you know, like we think of it as being, I mean, it would have been a smelly place, like any pre-modern city, he's much more focused on noise. And in fact, for him, the like countryside, stagnant water, these are the things that are, um, but yeah, people have done that, but I think much more strangely in a classical context now. So I think partly because, I mean, there is different work down on smell, if the census has been a big thing in archaeology, but it does tend to, almost all just to be another way to talk about vision. Yeah, Jill's point about viewscape was, um, I mean, she, you, you, you've nailed it in terms of like what, what archaeologists tend to be able to feel they can reconstruct. But I have heard one person talk about smellscapes. Um, and it was about, again, it was about, a, this is a, a thing that I think is relevant, that it was about urban environments in medieval times. Um, about the, if there was a, a, a slaughterhouse or a tannery, but evidently tanneries are the worst. Worst. worst, yeah. <laughs> um, that that it, downwind of there, it just has a very profound organizing effect on where people will live mm -hmm. and who lives there. That's interesting. I think people also implicitly talk about it a lot, though, in talking about the choices, the practical choices of where you dispose of trash and where you don't. You know, so right. trash pits are a thing that we talk about constantly in the archaeological record, and the underlying assumption there is people bury their trash because trash smells, and this is a way to sort of, to, you know, for archaeologists to understand disposal practices and where trash is and where trash isn't. And I think, in that sense, smell is is actually there and being accounted for by archaeologists, but not necessarily being talked about explicitly, just almost being assumed. Yeah. And that, I think, is, is interesting because that's not quite the same as like not considering it. It's almost taking it for granted that like we we think trash smells bad, so people in the past did too, and so they bury their trash in, in certain places or they dispose of it in certain parts of the site and not in others. Exactly. And this, I said, one of the things, when I first heard Jill talk about this, I became really interested and looked at how the dead are treated in other places. And one thing I had never considered, so burial within houses is very, very common in Mesopotamia. It's a tradition that lasts in certain places you know, over millennia. And I had never thought about the fact that if you dig up the floor of your house and you bury someone not very deep, I mean, you're going to smell that as well. Yeah until I was looking at ethnographic examples where people talked very much about what the smell of death was like for these 
domestic burials under the floor. And that was interesting to me because I was like, I've never thought about that. And if you think, I mean, I think of Alain Corbin, like the like French historian who writes about changing regimes of smell. And you know, very much this idea that we can't assume that what we find unpleasant like, mm -hmm. has always been considered unpleasant. And no one that I can think of really does that so much mm -hmm. archaeologically. There's a, a big literature on the smell of smoke because it crosses over into incense. Mm -hmm. um, but the choice of fuels probably has a much more profound effect than we um, give it credit for, both in terms of what it says about what you're trying to accomplish terms of burning and then who you want to communicate with. There's a, a pretty powerful argument about the early history of cooking way back in like, you know, a million years ago, a million and a half years ago, about whether or not the smell of toasted food would have been so irresistible to ancient hominins that they like are willing to like change their social organization to get close to the person who knows how to cook. Um, that's it's a it's a shallow argument but a, a provocative one from the point of view of smell. And I think that the smell of drying and rotting is just as important. I'm totally on Jill's side here because it's so important when you are actually out there experiencing it. I think there's probably, I would love to talk to you about what it's like, what it smells like when there's a dead body lying there on a, on a dry, cold place like where I work versus a moist, warm place that you would have experienced. Those environmental differences, I think, might really be a distinctive. And they last longer, right? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, putrefaction lasts longer in that kind of environment. If it's dry, it looks faster. If it's like if it's buried in a wet environment, way slower. You know, so they, like I mentioned, it's curious if people do things to speed it up or slow it down. It seems to me that though anthropologists are sort of little disposed toward making claims toward universals <laughs> nowadays, that there's a kind of causal relationship between human organizational behavior and intensity of of odor and, and, you know and most of those walls work as well but, uh, yeah uh, well, there's that wait, yeah. So, wait so you meant social organization intensity of odor yeah yeah I mean, I mean you you don't want to go where things stink nor do you want it to be well unless it gives you power know, unless it's there's right. sort of ritually invoked yeah. as a sort of I, I thought you were sort of doing the opposite, which was saying that, like, well, when you get more and more people, well, no, <laughs> like, things you know, stay more, more and less, more. You know, yeah. the scale of the sort of, yeah. you know, how, how bad or how good does it stink, yeah. right? And then the sort of and, attributions that are very sociocentric in terms of how people invoke these sorts of smells uh, ritually or otherwise. Well, smell doesn't, I mean, one of the interesting things about it is that people seem to divide sense pretty much cross-culturally into good and bad categories, but those categories are in no way fixed. In fact, they're entirely unfixed. And it's an entirely learned thing, right? Because it's all kind of experiential, even on the level of, um, even on sort of the level of inspiration, right? Like it's not even something that has to be done in terms of later process. And I, I think, just given this case, um, I don't know that I ever would have made as much of this suggestion as I do if there had, if they weren't at a period of time with this urbanization, if they weren't at a period of time where clearly space was becoming important and, space, and resources were in there, and that there was, there was a need, I feel a need to not have, we don't have veneration areas, they don't give the space over to them. Right, so in more, even more than that, I, that's, that's why I feel like there's this need to, for the social death. There is a need for the social death to, to keep more of these resources for the, for the expanding city, for this city. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether, you, I'm sure you remember the Archery Barrow Run case. Yeah. Where like 200 year old out of date cemetery became like uncontrollably hidden and forgotten. But the, the, the hospital where I was born in Wilmington, had a cemetery behind it. And I, like it it would have been a cemetery the year I was born. And about ten years ago, it was revealed that they had asphalted it over and it was a parking lot. And it was revealed when they started re taking the parking lot up to put up more hospital. And I thought, wow, that is a really critical piece of chronological information about how long it takes you to get where you put your people. 
or stop caring or stop um, associating that with where things happen and where it, your, your point about rights and resources, I think, has very strong. It's like, don't, you know, we can't be tied down by where our grandfathers had land or had animals or have a right to water. We've just got to do that. Right. And it's only, you know, and that becomes a real source of power when it's only a few people. Like, surely there were some people who were allowed to, to venerate their ancestors. Right? And, and that, that in, in itself is a, is a real problem. And I think we do a disservice, you know, when we all, I, I think uh, a lot of people, myself included, we, we, you know, when we think about the past, you use your own views creep in, of course. But um, this notion that we assume that all ancient people totally revered their ancestors always and forever and, and you know, felt so incredibly differently about them and never, you know, desecrated them is, is just baloney. And of course, it's, they did all sorts of things. <laughs> I guess that brings up an interesting question about whether, again, coming from the perspective of an Americanist, you know, often when we want to be able to talk about these processes of social death that, you know, maybe appear in the archaeological record differentially by culture, we look to contemporary ethnographic analogy, et cetera, to sort of talk about the belief systems of these groups, and in particular the idea of, you know, when does a soul sort of move on and what does that look like? Do you have any of that sort of evidence for this area that you could draw on, either textual evidence from a bit later in time or, or sort of contemporary religious evidence to sort of think about where this goes? So, I, I'm gonna, right, I'm gonna, so what we have is definitely from later, and the, I'm thinking about the earliest writings that discuss the nether world or that discuss death, talk about another world, talk about where you go afterwards and it's up to your relatives and your ancestors to keep to, to, to prevent you from becoming a ghost and haunting them. It's up to your relatives to, to give you food and water. It's up to them to get you to the nether world. It's up to them to so you know if you, you bad things happen to you if you forget them. That's that's the story. And of course since it needed to be right, since it needed to be written about it probably wasn't happening. Right? I think you probably have to think of it that way. It's like any law gets written when you need to. So the stories about what happens to your ancestors if you forget to venerate them only get to be, need to be written when you're not venerating them. So I think we have to assume at some point in time somebody decided this needed to be done, maybe maybe, maybe as a way to to claim lands, maybe as a way to, you know, to keep resources, but um, I don't know. Lauren, maybe you do, but I'm, I'm not. I'm just thinking, I mean, like, you know, when we're dealing with, in terms of, like, ethnographic, modern day, the time depth is so great, um, as the changes in religion, you know, of course, in this place right now, but I feel like, and even honestly, between this time and those texts, there's um, about 2,000 years, right? But, I mean, this is another thing that I was kind of thinking about, but if you, if you go forward about a millennium into the third millennium BC, when we have more, just more excavations, probably because <laughs> it's more available, you do have these different, um, these kind of, it seems like divided processes. Like there's this famous site that, did you work at all? You did, right? Yeah, but yeah. yeah. So it's this. It was weird, I worked there. Yeah. <laughs> there's like this a really cool site in Syria that, again, has evidence for multi-staged disposal of the dead. And the last stage seems to have been incorporating disarticulated remains and beads and pottery and building like a mound out of it, which was also layered. It's, we call, it's called the white monument because it looked white. And so I don't know if that's another, I mean, the excavator thought about that in terms of commemoration. Um, I mean, I I wrote about the possibility that people are going to sort of very odd kind of burial sites with a lot of them and leaving things as a way of dealing with the dead. I think that's especially the case. There are texts from about 2400 BC, so a little bit closer in time, that talk very much about the role of death in kind of political transformation. That before the king and queen can kind of become the king and queen, 
there's this long journey that involves a pilgrimage and then going into the royal mausoleum and spending a night there. <laughs> like <laughs> sitting with sitting in the thrones of the dead king and queen and sleeping. And they talk about scents. They talk about oils and perfume. And they talk yeah, it's all about scents, but it's this whole thing and it's only when the light shines they become the new king and the new queen. So it's a very you know, clearly, at least at that point, it's one of the, I mean, it's, it's one of the, it's really the earliest ritual text that we have from, from like this tradition. Yeah. yeah. Send matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it must just be so strange. Dead, 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 d